Hey, what's going on everyone? My name is Scott Shell. Uh, if you want to go ahead and check out my credentials, go to scottshell.net. It has all of my academic info and whatnot on that website. So today I want to go ahead and talk about Proto-Germanic long vowels. Uh, this is going to be part of a series where I talk about Proto-Germanic long vowels into various Germanic languages and also the short vowels into the various Germanic languages. Same thing with the diphthongs and eventually the consonants. So the reason I want to do this though is to show you all how and why languages are related. But today we're going to just focus on the long vowels because as you will see, this stuff can get uh, pretty complex and kind of mind numbing for a lot of people. So um, we're going to just kind of break it down, you know, one section at a time. We're going to do the long vowels and then we'll, you know, do some other videos later to follow up on that. So the first thing I want to say here too is that really there was no such thing as Proto-Scandinavian. I've said that before. Um, it's not just my opinion. I mean, there's all kinds of research out there, particularly by like Elmer Antonsen, um, who talks about a language group called Northwest Germanic. Um, and essentially this is kind of sort of what the Scandinavians are trying to call Proto-Scandinavian. Um, so you're never going to hear Proto-Scandinavian come up here, uh, as far as vowel shifts are concerned or consonant shifts later. Uh, because simply Proto-Scandinavian was just created as basically a political response to Proto-Germanic. And so if this is uh, unfamiliar to you, just go ahead and check out my video called uh, Germanic versus Scandinavian. Um, I'll go ahead and put a link to the video in the video description below. So like I was saying, we're going to go ahead and talk about the root vowels, but of course I don't expect everyone to know what a root vowel is, so let's go ahead and get that out of the way. So if you look at English and we look at the word bless, for example, bless is the root um, and the root vowel is going to be obviously within the root. So you're going to see that E there. Um, that's going to be our root vowel. If you encounter something like blesses or blessing or um, I don't know, uh, have have blessed, then you'll see that that root vowel is still the same in these instances uh, and all that extra stuff that's added to the root word. It's just inflectional morphology. That's really like uh, singulars and plurals and tenses and stuff like that. So that's not the, the vowels outside of the root word are not called root vowels. Um, another example is write. You'll see like I write, you write, he writes, they write. Um, I have written, they have written and so on and so forth. But notice there in the example um, that the root vowel in that root word never changes. The E on the end of right is just something that's left over. It's archaic. Of course, we don't pronounce that E, but it's still present in the orthography. So another one you'll see here is uh, clean in my third example. Uh, you'll see that it's spelled with an E and an A. Uh, really, those two vowels, orthographically speaking, make up one sound. So it's still I clean, you clean, he cleans, she cleans. Uh, they have cleaned. I have cleaned. They are cleaning, so on and so forth. But again, all that extra stuff tacked onto the end of the root word um, is just inflectional morphology. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense as far as what a root vowel is, because that's exactly what we're going to talk about in this particular video as far as proto-Germanic root vowels and what we call reflexes in the various Germanic languages. So the first vowel we're going to talk about is pretty easy. It's uh, proto-Germanic long I. Um, you'll see that there is a word on the screen and it is pronounced Sweenaz and it's it's pig. It's literally a, a literally a, a direct um, predecessor to swine. And so how do we come up with that long I though when we reconstruct this Proto-Germanic word? Well, take a look at the data. You'll see that we have Old High German Sween. We'll have, you know, Old English Sween, Old Saxon Sween. Uh, we even have Old Norse Sween. Um, and even that I is retained in Latin, even though that's not obviously a Germanic language, it's still part of the Indo-European system. So basically, it's, it's really simple, right? How do we reconstruct the root vowel for this word? Well, look at the data. You see that all of the root vowels have long I's. So logically, we're going to go ahead and reconstruct this word to have a root vowel that's a long I. Notice too, I mean, you have an S there. The S obviously gets reconstructed and so on and so forth. But I really want you to just pay attention to the root vowel because all the consonants and stuff are just going to come uh, much later. So hopefully that makes sense. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. And now we have our long U. As you see here, I've reconstructed the word fulas, which is just foul as in something that's foul smelling. 
Uh, why would we reconstruct it as a long U though? Well, again, look at the data. So we have um, Old English Fool, Old High German Fool, uh, Old Saxon Fool, but I actually had to reconstruct that one. Um, it's just, it's not, it doesn't exist in the corpus, but I can safely say it's with a long U. Um, and then of course we have Old Norse Fool as well. Or if you want to pronounce that with uh, modern Icelandic instead of reconstructed pronunciation, it's Fut, Fut. But either way, the long U is obviously still present. And so again, you know, you have long U's and all of the reflexes here. Again, the, the reflexes are just the vowels that appear in the Germanic languages later. Um, so there's no reason to, to really propose something else. And another example here could be a runo. I talk about runes all the time on my channel. So this gives me an opportunity, of course, to throw in the word rune. Uh, you'll see that that's reconstructed in its root form. Its root form is technically just R-U-N. So the O is just, um, it's marking gender. But the root vowel, of course, is, is a U. So we have um, rune, for example, in Old Norse, uh, in the reflexes. We have runa in Gothic, runa in Old Saxon, and so on and so forth. So again, as you can see from the data right there, what do we do? We just simply reconstruct that U sound into Proto-Germanic. Um, it's really not that difficult. As, as you'll see after this, things are going to get a little more strange. Um, but still, it's not too terrible, so just hang in there with me. And uh, if you can get through these long vowels and really the concept of what we're going to call it E1 and E2 later, then you're golden. You're not going to have any problem you know, with the rest of these videos So uh, concerning sound shifts. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and look at something called a vowel merger. Uh, Indo-European long O and long A merge into Germanic or Proto-Germanic long O. So Proto-Germanic did have a long A, but it didn't pop up until way later in the system. And we're going to go ahead and talk about that at the end of the video. So how do we reconstruct this long O in a Proto-Germanic then? So if you look at all the data, you'll see that we have long O everywhere except for Old High German. So you have Blome in uh, Old Norse, you have Bloma in Gothic, you have Blomo in Old English and in Old Saxon, but in Old High German, you have Blomo. So you get a diphthong. And so what this means really is like, these long O's had come from Proto-Germanic, but went through a secondary shift in Old High German to where that long O became a diphthong. And so we can safely assume that the Proto-Germanic long vowel was actually a long O and Old High German had a vowel shift that was specific to Old High German to sort of differentiate it um, from the other Germanic languages in this particular regard. All right, now we're going to go ahead and talk about long E, which is also referred to as E1. Um, this one's actually pretty easy to deal with when compared to E2 because E2 is just a really strange vowel. Um, but what happens with this is just, it's inherited from Indo-European long E. It stays as long E in Proto-Germanic. Um, as you see here with the word I've reconstructed for you with say these, this is just the word for seed. So, and then you have this vowel from Proto-Germanic continuing as this long vowel in Gothic. And so that's why we have monosaths. However, what's strange about this vowel is that it is lowered in the other Germanic languages. So if you look at Old Norse, you'll see Solth, or if you want the modern Icelandic pronunciation, Solth. And you'll see, of course, that it is also lowered in Old High German and Old Saxon as well. Old English, however, is the weird one because it is lowered, but not completely lowered to A. So it's actually just lowered to Ash. And so that's why we have Sat, Sat. And then if we want to look at the Proto-Germanic word for deed, this is also another good example where that long E from Indo-European uh, appears as a long E in Proto-Germanic and then gadaiths in Gothic. So you have that long E in Gothic. But again, this vowel is lowered in the other Germanic languages. So you have dot, for example, in Old Saxon, which is just deed. Uh, you have tot in Old High German, which again is just deed. But then you have this weird form again in Old English, dad, in which case is not quite lowered from that E to A. It's in that intermediary stage, but it's still being lowered. So hopefully that makes sense with E1. That's all I want you to know about as far as this root vowel is concerned uh, for E1. All right, now let's go ahead and tackle this beast called E2. 
Um, so go ahead and look at this form here. Uh, you're probably like, what the hell is that? You know, X E to R plus Y equals Z to the second power. You know, what is this weird pronunciation? Um, that X there is actually just like the German Ach as an Ach laut. It's, it's not really a standard H sound. Um, but you know, how is it that we reconstruct X E to R? This is just simply the word here in English. You would think it'd be pretty simple, pretty common word. Well, <laughs> so here you can see with Old English, we have Heir. Old Saxon, we have Heir. Old Norse, we actually have Heir. Even though it's that long E sound, you do have it palatalized. Then you have Old High German, Heir, Heir. All these weird things are going on, right? So as you can already tell, this uh, vowel is very problematic. Uh, you would think, like, yeah, maybe it has something to do with the R, right? Maybe the R is coloring that or something. Um, but this occurs in other places, too, aside from where that, that R is. So this vowel has been a problem for decades. Um, we're still trying to figure out where this vowel came from. Some people have suggested it came from Indo-European. Long E plus short I. Uh, really, it's more of this this Northwest Germanic phenomenon that we're going to, you know, del delve into in just a second with kind of like its ancestry and all these other various positions, particularly like in Gothic. So while it does remain as Heer and Heer or even Heer in Old Norse and Heer, Heer in Old High German, uh, like I was saying before, we do have this long E, which is E2 in various other words too. So if we look at Gothic, for instance, um, we're going to go ahead and look at the word for table here. Uh, you'll see it as mace. Um, we also have fera, which means region. And we also have kreks, which is, which is really the word Greek. Notice that all of those instances are examples of loan words. So it's this, again, it's this weird vowel that finds its place in these very strange positions. Um, we don't always find it in loan words in Gothic. I mean, arguably, we do also see it in a word like hehet. Hehet, that's just German heisen. Um, in English, that just means to be called. But what's happening is that hehet is two different E qualities, and that second A is actually E2. And that's just the preterite form, like he is called or she is called. Michael or whatever. So as far as that weird reduplication is concerned, we actually do see it pop up in the other Germanic languages too, but it's not reduplicated uh, to indicate past tense. So we'll see like Hias in Old High German. We'll see Hias as well in Old High German. Um, and then of course we see Hies in Old High German, which sounds very close, of course, to modern German. All right, so let's go ahead and look at these last three. Um, this is going to be at a late Proto-Germanic stage where these vowels show up. So it's going to be a plus n plus h, i plus n plus h, and then u plus n plus h. Notice I'm not saying ing. It's actually just n. It's that weird, it's what's called a velar nasal. It's this n sound in the back of your throat. So this is actually how we get Proto-Germanic long a. What happens is that the n sound in the early proto in the I'm sorry, the late Proto-Germanic stages, then you know falls off, and then we have this what's called a nasalized A. And so, as you see here, we have Proto-Germanic bronkto, which is just brought. So then you'll see Old High German, Gothic, and uh, Old Saxon develop this this sound now, this long A, and that's how we get brachta, brachta earlier from that A plus the N sound. However, in Old English, that long A is eventually raised, and that's how we wind up with brochte. So then we have I plus N and H. Um, this one's very easy to talk about. Same thing happens. Uh, you wind up with a long I, a nasalized um, a long I, and that's how we get Thihan in Gothic, and then also Thihan in Old Saxon. And then, of course, we have the U, N, and H sound, which goes through the same process. Uh, the N drops off, becomes long and nasalized, and we wind up with forms like Thuchta in uh, Gothic or Thuchta in Old Saxon. So that's all I wanted to talk to you guys about today. I'm going to have some more videos coming out where we're going to zero in on the short vowels. Uh, we're going to talk about the diphthongs. 
Um, and we're going to talk about the consonants and whatnot. You can see, too, how this can get complicated because if you have a UO in a language and you're like, oh, that's like a weird old high German thing, long O becoming UO. Well, we do have the diphthong that still goes into these other languages as a UO, but it doesn't come from long O, it comes from a diphthong. So you have to really think about the source, like where did these sounds actually come from? And uh, it requires a lot of practice, but, uh, you know, just hang in there, watch these videos, and we'll all get through it. <laughs> So anyway, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them below. Otherwise, I'll see you all soon. Um, got more videos, of course, on Ablaut and Umlaut as well. I completely avoided that in this video because, as you can see, it's already enough info right in this video um, to then go ahead and start getting into Ablaut and Umlaut and whatnot. So anyway, um, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't subscribed and hit the notification bell. I am told that that helps out tremendously. <laughs> All right. Take care, guys.